Here we go, here we go. Hmm. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, it's so cool. <laughs> Hi, my name is Millie. If you're new to this channel, uh, welcome. And um, I am autistic and ADHD, and I make videos just generally about neurodiversity and my experience. And today, I'm going to be talking about um, talking about roller coasters, which is one of my uh, one of my absolute most favorite special interests. Um, just to give you an idea, I don't actually get to ride roller coasters a lot, but I do watch roller coaster review videos and park review videos, like basically every single day. It's kind of one of the things I do. Yeah, I'm just endlessly fascinated with the design and the experience and the love-hate relationship with the, the sensations. If you want to skip ahead, there'll be chapter markers in the description. And uh, what I'll be going over is uh, this is about my trip to Fantasialand in Germany. So um, I'll be talking about the sensory experience, uh, like generally how that relates for me being neurodivergent uh, with rides and roller coasters. And then I'll be uh, talking about ride reviews of everything, I uh, all the rides I went on at Fantasialand. And uh, I'll talk, be talking about the that park's accessibility a bit. And uh, then some of the hotels, like we stayed at one of the on-site themed hotels, which was really cool. And a bit about the food in the hotels and in the park. And um, some tips about uh, visiting the park. And um, yeah, and just some, and my general thoughts. So I was just recently lucky enough to visit Fantasyland in Brühl in Germany and um, yeah, this was a total dream park. Um, I love parks that have a really heavily themed, you know, more like Disney parks where it's really immersive and I, I don't know, I can really feel that the magic of um, these fantasy places they're creating and I love that so much. Um, I've always been a big Disney person, so that's kind of what my standard I'm comparing everything to, but Germany has some of the best best theme parks in the world. And, um, and of course, Disney was based on some older European parks uh, where Walt Disney got his inspiration. So it kind of goes back and forth with the inspiration there. And uh, you can tell Fantasyland is very, seems very based on Disneyland in turn. Yeah, Fantasyland has some of the best theming of any park I've been to and uh, some of the best roller coasters in the world. And certainly, uh, we'll talk about it later, but it has the best one that I've ever been on. And so this is a dream park, but there was just one specific roller coaster, especially that I was just, I was just dreaming about going on that I was so excited to go and do. So I, I, uh, I managed to do that against all the odds of traveling and even getting sick on my trip and I had just recovered enough to still be able to do this. And um, yeah, so I so appreciate it. my My mom took me along on this trip. So um, I was very lucky to be able to, uh, to be able to experience, experience this, something I wouldn't be able to afford to do otherwise. So because I'm autistic, um, what I know about myself as it relates to rides is I really like a sense of of speed, of just moving really fast. Uh, lots of, you know, like the wind and air in my face. And I like positive G-forces. So if you know positive G-forces, when you get to a valley or going around a loop, like the sensation of being pushed into your seat, right? And then conversely, negative Gs, so on a roller coaster or a drop tower when it's going down and you're lifting out of your seat, um, that's, uh, that's negative G-forces. So that lifting out of your seat, you call uh, uh, airtime. Um, so you can have float or airtime where you just feel like you're floating or ejector airtime where you're actually 
kind of launched out of your seat and only the restraints are holding you in. So and that's what, uh, you know, if you haven't been on roller coasters, that's what makes them really scary, but really thrilling as well. So even though I like roller coasters, I really don't like all rides. I'm very, very particular because of this. Uh, I still get overwhelmed. It's just that a roller coaster, it's just like, it's like I can endure it. You know, it's that feeling of like, okay, okay, okay. I can endure anything for 60 to 90 seconds. You know, it's still really hard, but I guess I'm just getting more positives out of it than negatives ultimately, because I still manage to go do it. But um, I don't like spinning. Uh, I get dizzy fairly quickly, you know, like some autistic people love spin the sensation of spinning and spinning on a chair. Like this is a turning chair, you know, I could just sit here and spin around on this. Some people would do that as sti like for stimming and find that uh, very calming and pleasing. But yeah, I just get super dizzy really quick. I find that really unpleasant. So I don't really like spinning, don't really like tumbling. Um, I do on like roller coasters where you, you know, you get flipped or go through a loop or like a roll, you have like zero G rolls and stuff like that. Um, but to me, that's more graceful. And I just don't like essentially like what you think of as fair rides or um, I call them, uh, you know, the more technical terms, flat rides. So yeah, those are the ones you typically see at fairs. Um, so because they're smaller and meant to be portable, they're usually, you know, something that spins around like this or like this and with tumbling and, you know, so most of those rides and drop towers because uh, drop towers are, you know, they're just about that uh, floater airtime or ejector, like that negative G sensation. So even though that's a big part of roller coasters, that's not the whole thing. So I don't really like a ride that's just about that, you know, and it's so much of the like, the worst part is the anticipation, right? So it's a lot of stress to only have a sensation that I don't even really like. And, and I think people think, cause like, I'm so into roller coasters. The thing is I don't love riding them as much as some coaster enthusiasts, but you know, I like I said, I love the design behind them and uh, the, like all those things, but, but I do like the experience, but it still is very like, I find the negative G is very uncomfortable. Like, yeah, it just gives me that squirmy, like pit of the stomach. Um, like I usually have my eyes closed and they're really intense rides, at least for the first few times. And, uh, and, and yeah, I'm all like crunched up and tense when there's negative G's and everything. Um, it always makes me wonder about people screaming. I've never been able to scream. I just get quiet and tense. I think I'm like not even really breathing maybe. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> that sounds terrible, but uh, yeah, by the time I get off, I guess, yeah, it's the adrenaline, the relief of like your brain thinking that you almost, you almost died and you just survived something. So, uh, you know, as soon as I get off, I'm giddy. And then, and then it's about like knowing that I've felt the sensations of that roller coaster. And every time it then gets easier. The first time is the worst and the scariest. And I get the jelly legs and my legs don't even want to walk me to the thing if it's something uh, that looks really intense. So I get all that, but I still do it anyways. I feel like a masochist a little bit. <laughs> in terms of noises, that's one of the biggest issues I have in the parks. Like it's kind of thrilling like to hear the launches and the screams and everything, but it just gets really overwhelming really fast. And I'm sensitive, really sensitive to all that stuff, especially really like sharp noises uh, that are very sudden. So, you know, you get like air brakes and the sound of hydraulics or, uh, you know, it was like, psh, like those kind of noises. Sorry for anybody that's startled by that. I should have warned you, but that like that kind of stuff. Um, 
and there's, you know, that's constant at the theme parks. And then you're waiting in line and as you get closer, it's kind of more and more like that. Um, so that part of it, like on, like the waiting in line for me is one of the hardest parts, especially because they often strip you of stuff you can hold, um, especially becoming more and more in these theme parks with complex tracks uh, where you can walk underneath and stuff. So they're doing things like metal detectors and lockers. So like some of these rides, I couldn't even have my glasses, uh, which was bothersome. And uh, yeah, I couldn't have my headphones especially. Um, so yeah, that, that was really challenging. So that's why ideally you want to be able to um, for accessibility to, to be able to skip the line. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And I think about roller coasters and rides in terms of autism and like just needing to feel comfortable by being in control of my environment and being able to like do things when I'm ready and, and roller coasters are none of those things, you know, so it's still almost like this being drawn to something that's kind of the worst for me. Like I'm afraid of heights. I am claustrophobic. Um, you know, every time the restraints get locked in, you know, lap bar over the shoulder restraints, especially if they're tight, and they like push in, like um, call it stapling when they uh, press the restraints so you can hardly move. Um, that gives me a sense of panic as soon as it happens. But then as soon as the ride's moving fast and you're being thrown through the air and stuff, you know, I just, my, my, like, my brain can't even process what's happening anymore. Um, so yeah, I just always thought that was interesting. It's like this, uh, yeah, this giving up of control to a machine. Like I'm just stapled into this giant machine and you know what, once the roller coaster train is launched or press the top of the lift hill and it's coasting, it's under its own power and then nobody's, it's under nobody's control until it comes back into the station. So, you know, that, that part terrifies me too. Sometimes you just have this moment, you've gotten this courage to get on the ride and it just starts rolling out and you're like, no, no, I'm not ready for this. And there's just nothing you can do. Sorry, scaring if anybody wants to go on a ride. That's part of it ends up making it fun. Like, you know, while the ride's getting going, that's kind of the worst part. And then it goes, and then it's so overwhelming, they don't even have time to think about it. And then you're back in the station, and you're laughing and crying, you know. For me, it's usually both. And um, yeah, and it's great. All right, now I'm going to talk about some of the rides I rode. Uh, I think I rode every roller coaster there, except for two. I rode Black Mamba, which is a uh, 2006. It's a B&M inverted coaster, and that one was extra special because it was wrapped around our hotel, which was so cool at Hotel Matamba. It just weaves in through the grounds of the hotel, weaves around this kid's play structure. Like, this is what's so amazing about this park. Like, it's so rare to be, you know, usually a roller coaster is in its own area, or maybe you can walk under part of it, but uh, most of it's just off in its own wooded area. But uh, this park is so dense, everything's kind of woven together, and all the walk ways around three levels. So uh, Black Mamba just weaves through these trenches and goes through a section of the hotel. And um, yeah, it's just, it's a super intense compact layout. Um, I thought it was actually really, really quite forceful. It's, it's a short ride. Um, actually, maybe I'm getting old, but uh, when I got off the ride, I'd actually uh, pulled a muscle in my calf. I think it was tense. So, you know, uh, inverted roller coasters, you're hanging underneath the track 
And this one does have a loop and some, uh, some pretty whippy transitions and helixes um, with a lot of positive g-forces. So I don't know if I was tense and I was holding my legs in or something, but uh, yeah, this one's short. It's super fun. And uh, it's just what makes it amazing is just the Africa theming and you're just so close to the ground because you good sense of speed and uh, it's very disorienting, like going through these trenches and just super close to plants and these water features. And you loop over uh, the walkway to the hotel. And, uh, and yeah, the lift hill goes up and into a tower that's part of the hotel and out the other side. So it's really cool how it interacts with the, uh, with the actual hotel. I also wrote uh, Colorado Adventure, which is a 1996 Vacoma mine train. And this one was cool. That's a really good mine train. Um, it's super fun. Um, it's not as nicely themed. You know, it's obviously not like Disney budget, but it has, it has good theming and it has uh, multiple indoor and outdoor sections. A big thing in this park is not knowing the extent of something. So you kind of see a lift hill and then, you know, it goes through into a building and then there's parts sticking out. So I didn't even realize that um, the first lift hill is kind of the smallest one, I think. And and you're just ripping around at good speed. It, it pulls you real, uh, really fast in the back, especially. And uh, yeah, the restraints are very restri restrictive, so you can get uh, some some airtime out of your seat pretty good in some parts and yeah and it actually has I think it has three lift hills or something so I just had no idea how long it was going to be so it has good length um, yeah just lots of twists and turns so really good pacing and uh, and again because you don't know where it's going to go it's super fun because it's just really unexpected in the in the course it's going to take um, so yeah, it seems like another one ex inspired by a Disney mine train, but, um, it's one of the best mine train roller coasters I've ever been on, I'd say. This road, Crazy Bats. Yeah, it's a Vic Vacoma indoor steel coaster. And again, it's just in a building, so I had no idea how long it was. I just had this feeling, I was like, you know just the vibe of going in the line and it's in like completely indoor closed coaster. I was like, I wonder if it's gonna be a little bit like, you know, just the queue had this vibes of uh, Space Mountain. I know the park is, uh, a lot of it's inspired by Disneyland. So, and, uh, and yeah, the cars on the track do look like if you're familiar with the, uh, the cars of Space Mountain and, and this one, uh, not the exact layout, but the general feeling of the roller coaster is very similar. So, so no big drops, just you know, just fast downhill, lots of speed, some quick turns, and again, I think three lifts, and again, like much longer than I expected. Um, so, not a lot of forces, just nice wind in your hair. But uh, this is my first time on a VR coaster, and that is just a super weird sensation. So you have a VR headset on, so your senses are blocked off because you have um, headphones on as well to get the audio and your eyes have the VR goggles. So you're seeing a scene and the motion in the scene, it's like you're on a motion simulator because the motion you're seeing in the scene matches like the turns you're taking the roller coaster, but you're actually in a physical roller coaster and moving. So it would probably be the worst one for motion sickness because your brain has just these moments of like the slight mismatch between what you're seeing and the sensation of the roller coaster, even though like it was synced quite well. But um, I thought they did a really good job with that actually. Uh, the graphics are a little cheesy, but the sensations were... I don't know. It was it was really fun, but bizarre. I had a bit of a love hate with that one. Um, the length and speed were really fun, and uh, 
yeah, the VR experience. I think I was a little freaked out just because I didn't like sitting there with a VR headset on. It just felt very vulnerable. Uh, like I get really tripped out in my head, you know, because I'm like overthinking everything. I'm anxious all the time. So I put that thing on and, and then I'm like, it's weird. I'm in this train full of people and ride operators and there's people in line, but I can't hear or see anything anymore. And I'm waiting for the train to start. And it's taking a long time because they have to get everybody set up and check their headsets and make sure everything's working. And I start just thinking in my head, like, am I the only person here? Like, what's going on? Why aren't we going? Am I still sitting in a roller coaster? This is so weird. And because I was tripped out, kind of like the worst, not the worst thing happened, but something did freak me out in that somebody suddenly was tapping on my shoulder and it was the person behind me or like the person in front of me reaching back or something because the ride operator was trying to get my attention. And so somebody tapped me and that just startled me so much. So that that kind of uh, threw me off big at the beginning of the ride. The ride was fun, just the beginning part. I didn't like having that headset on and then uh, they wanted me to take it off because, I don't know, there was some issue with the system. It seems to have a lot of technical issues. Um, so they got that working. But yeah, that was just very startling to have a hand come out of nowhere and touch me when my eyes are seeing other things. So I didn't like that much. A note for that one, the line, the queue is super, um, super claustrophobic. And it just winds in... It's going back and forth outside. It's a really boring queue outside, so that's already frustrating. You're just going through switchbacks and there's no theming. And then once you get inside, you're just in such a narrow, like a narrow hallway with a low ceiling and it's just exactly two people wide. And it's just people all the way up waiting and you have to go up three narrow staircases that the whole way through the whole line. I did not like that at all, so. Um, that was the worst part. Ride was fun, so it was worth it. But um, yeah, just the queuing experience. And I don't like the VR overall, but uh, the rides are fun, like uh, good for the family. Um, not too intense, but nice long ride. Another more family coaster, but like way more thrilling, I'd say, and way more short. And super cool theming was a uh, Rike. And uh, that was in the mystery area and this um, smaller area called Klukheim, which has this like Norse mythology, like rock face, almost like, yeah, Norse, but like heavy metal vibe. It's all very intense. And it was so gloomy that day. So it made it look even more, uh, um, more intense. But, uh, but uh, one of the biggest, thrilling coasters they have there, which is um, which is Terran, weaves just a whole spaghetti mess of track inside that whole area. And um, so that one's really intimidating, but then they have Rike, which is a family boomerang style coaster. It's, uh, yeah, it's from 2016. It's a Vacoma boomerang. So you get pulled up a hill and then uh, get pulled up a hill backwards, rip through the f through the station, and then uh, yeah, you have some nice like bunny hills and some uh, some fairly whippy transitions, and uh, you get to the end and then roll back through the whole thing backwards, and uh, yeah, that one's just that one's just super fun. It's neat how it weaves through the other track, so. Yeah, so younger people, younger writers can go on that one and still be part of the theming and intensity of the other experience. And the two, the two roller coasters just rip right by it, but close by each other at uh, certain parts, parts, which is really cool. So I rode Terran in that area. So that's the 2016 Intamin Steel. Um, that's a multi-launch coaster. And it's just so cool how these parks, it's because they have people living nearby. They have to um, dig everything into these trenches. So like I was saying before, you kind of walk on the second level and the stations are usually on the lower level. 
and then the peak of hills are usually on the second and third level. So the coaster is kind of launching on the lower level and then going up to level kind of three or four and then back down and looping around and all over the place. And it's just beautiful to watch in that area. Like as a coaster nerd enthusiast, there's just so many angles, like walkways, you can get close to the track and um, just watch the ride go around and uh, get really close to the me mechanics and stuff. And it, it's just so cool. I was just, I was just absolutely blown away by that. And um, yeah, this ride, some people said it wasn't super intense. I don't know if it was running fast that day or something, but um, it's just a lap bar. So you're free up top. And it does a lot of like, it dives. And I was getting good, like pretty good, say like ejector, like, I felt like I was getting pulled out of my seat pretty good because it would dive, but you'd also, you know, first first be whipped into the opposite direction, you know, whip like this and then dive down. So you're kind of thrown out of your seat and then pulled in the opposite direction. So it's pretty it's pretty wild sensation. Like that was the one where the most I got off the ride and I was just laughing and I could like I couldn't even walk straight, you know? So uh and um, yeah, so you're just whipping all over the place, uh, little bunny hills up and down. And then it has a second launch and you go through the second part. It's actually like another, the theme of this whole theme park, I think is like every, everything's much longer than you expect in a good way. Cause that's again, uh, a, nice, a nice long ride experience. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about Fly. This is the one, this is the one that I was dreaming about to ride, I was so excited about. Um, this is uh, for 2020, I think. Vacoma, yeah, it's a launched flying coaster. So it's uh, so again, track is above you, but um, yeah, you're in a, in a flying position. So just head forward, feet behind you. This is a first of its kind. Um, there, like there's been other flying coasters before these other models, but um, but this is a new model and they just absolutely nailed everything about this. Like the engineering between, be, uh, behind how the trains load even is just absolutely genius. The theming of this whole area. So this is in the Rookberg area and, um, and the area you see here is like one giant hotel around the outside and you're just inside this hotel and it's just an absolutely stunning use of multi-purpose. Um, you know, the hotel actually houses guests and it's, but it's also part of the ride experience, but it also makes a physical barrier so that uh, the people in the neighborhood can't see or hear the noise, you know, like I love that about this area, you know, you can, you can have NIMBYs, but instead of saying, uh, like, not in my backyard, you just say, well, in my backyard, but I don't want to see or hear it. And then the, the park has to spend a ton of money and come up with these creat creative ways to hide an entire roller coaster. So, so it's like you're outside, but it's like you're inside. I just... You walk through this archway and get into this area, so it's completely self-contained. And it was one of the first things we checked out. And I walked in there, and the theme music was playing. It's giving me chills right now thinking about it. It was just, like, I honestly teared up. I was just, I was so overwhelmed. Like, I'd just been dreaming about going there and watching videos about it. And then just to be standing there... And Fantasyland, like the people doing the music scoring even just, it's just so perfect for this steampunk. Like it's this like adventurous, triumphant, um, you know, like, but sense of danger or adventure music that's playing. And, and you just walk in and there's like fake, like, like, coal tips and fountains and furnaces and uh, big boilers and 
and there's a part where um, it's some kind of machine that's using steam and it actually blows like there's a smoke machine in there or something so it's actually like ejecting steam and it's timed so that it blasts uh, the trains with the smoke as they come through that section and the track is all weaved through there and it just looks so beautiful you know and and maybe they could have nailed the theming but the ride wouldn't have would have problems but like to me this ride is almost perfect it rides so smooth uh the restraints are comfortable which considering the position you're in is amazing um the operations are fantastic like i could not believe how fast because they have to do a lot you know you're weaving through this convoluted line which is still entertaining because just this area is just so heavily themed like every part you're in you know you get feet away from the track which is really cool um you can see the hotel rooms are right there and uh um but you get into the the bowels of the entrance area and that's complicated and they have to um you have to go through metal detectors because there's like nothing on the ride that's why there's not footage of the ride uh because they want that to be immer immersive they want people flying right over above your head without nets or cages underneath for lost items. Um, so yeah, the effort they went through to make it immersive is just unreal. And um, and yeah, but they still managed to get people on really quick. You know, I wouldn't believe, couldn't believe considering that the, the way the tracks work, like normally with flying coasters, you have the seat part has to move because it has to get from sitting position into laying position. This part, they twisted the track. So you watch, walk into the station and you're looking at the track twisted facing you instead of on the ground. And, and, uh, and the seats are rotated vertical. And so you can just sit in the seats upright like you would on a normal roller coaster. And they close the things. And I couldn't believe like, we had sat down, you have to clip into leg restraints as well. And they would load the whole train. And I think by the time I sat down, I rode it three times. I think every time the train departed, you know, like having to get anybody, everybody in the train, check all the restraints and everything. And uh, yeah, they launched the train always, I don't know, within like 20 seconds of me sitting down, it felt like. And even just the start of the ride is so cool because you're sitting upright and you're just being pulled around this helix going upwards into the second level launch area. And, and you're sitting upwards like this. And, uh, and the triumphant music's playing. And then the whole theme is like you're on this like jetpack uh, steampunk train system. And that's like the train station or that's, you know, that's your flight and you're going into the launch, like the runway, basically. And so you're being lifted up into the launch bay runway kind of thing. And and they just time it so that, oh, this whole thing is giving me chills the whole time, uh, just thinking about it. But you're just sitting there, you're way back against the track. And as, it, as it's time, so as you're getting to the first launch that accelerates you you're just twisting and then into flying position and then you rotate into flying position and then as soon as you're like oh wow now i'm pointing forward then it's like and launches you and it's not super forceful i love this because yeah some rides are more thrilling terran is more wild and disorienting but I thought like this one, I was just had my eyes open the whole time and um, it was just forceful enough that you get some good positive G's as you know, it swoops up, you kind of swoop up over buildings and dive right down all the way to the ground underneath the buildings and through trenches. And, um, and at the bottoms, you, you, when you bottom out, you do get a lot of, a lot of positive G's, which feels great. And, uh, and you do get negative G's as well um, in some of the peaks and drops and stuff. But um, 
the best thing about it is it's just graceful and and it's the closest I've felt like to actually flying. Like you have the whole train there and the other people, but you almost forget about that. Like there's this part where I think it's where the second launch. So you're launching through a dark tunnel. You come out in the bright light, you're kind of disoriented and you just shoot straight up and you're going over one of the fake buildings and you just roll and flip over top and it does an inversion, like a, it has a zero G roll over the top of the building. And it just feels so effortless. Like it feels like I'm doing that, like I have a jetpack and I'm flying. Like the whole thing has this sensation like I have a jetpack, I can fly, and I'm like just pushing it really hard. I'm like showing off, I'm like pushing to the limits. I'm just like, you know, blasting, going down and like, uh, like, hold, like hold on, go as fast as possible. And just like, uh, you know, getting the G forces, or like like you're in a pushing the limits of a fighter jet or something, and uh, and then showing off, just like flying around, flying around this area. Uh, it's so cool, like such a joyful thing. It's so fleeting to have those moments in your life where something is pure, like actual fun or pure happiness. Like that doesn't happen to me a lot ever. It's like a you know, most I can shoot for is contentment most of the time. But those of like that, like 90 seconds or whatever is just total pure joy. Yeah, it's so good. One thing it reminded me of, if people play uh, Bioshock at all, it reminds me of, you know, Bioshock's very steampunk, but Bioshock Infinite I'm surprised I haven't heard somebody talk about this. I mean, I'm sure other people have made this distinction or this connection, but I just haven't heard it yet. But it's like Bioshock Infinite. There's these sky rails. It's a big part of the game. You're in these floating, um, yeah, steampunk, but like mid-century uh, buildings and they're floating and connecting them. There's these rails and you hook onto them and uh, that's how you get from area to area or sometimes they loop around the area. This is exactly what it looks like in the, that game, but you get to do this in real life, but just more in a flying position instead of an upright position. Yeah, that's the best ride I've been on for sure. Best roller coaster I've ever been on. Fly at Fantasyland. In terms of other non-coaster rides that I tried, I went on Chiapas, which is a really fantastic 2014. That's an Intamin log flume. Again, comparing it to like Disney log flumes, it's like everything in this park is like, oh, it looks sort of Disney, but then it's much more intense and thrilling. That one, to make a note, I felt claustrophobic. Other log flumes, you're just in a log and it's open. But this one, you have uh, uh, you have restraints that lock down um, and then uh, a bar or a divider between each person. And they really cram... I don't know how many, five or six people into one log. So I felt fairly claustrophobic on that one, but it's just super fun. Again, great theming, great drops. It has surprising elements where you like turn on a turntable and suddenly you're floating backwards or going down a, a drop backwards. And then the big drop, which is such a showpiece, that whole area with the drop is just so beautifully themed again. Um, as a huge drop. I think it's the steepest log flume drop in the world. Um, it seems almost like near vertical. It's, a fan, it's like a super, super fun drop. I love that last drop actually. And it's actually cool because usually a log flume, you know, drop and then flat water and the water slows you down. But that's you actually dip down and then up into a bunny hill. So you get a last little pop of uh, floater airtime and then into the splashdown. And uh, the only thing it was, you know, this is fall and it was cold. So I made sure I did the last ride of the way, ride of the day, but I did get wet. And uh, sensory wise, that's one of my most hated things is getting wet. They have these people dryers we can pay to get blow dried, but luckily we're staying at the hotel. So I went back to the hotel room and dried off. Uh, we went on Geister Rickshaw, which is a 
Schwarzkopf, 1981, Dark Ride. It's If you've been on the Haunted Mansion, that's one of my favorite rides of all time at Disneyland. <laughs> this is not like that in terms of... Uh, it's outdated, but not in a charming way, I feel like, anymore. And a little bit more, like, scary in a, like, Germanic... It's supposed to be, like, Chinese... Because it's in the China area. So it has some Chinese theming, but then also maybe some, like, Germanic folklore. It's a whole mishmash of stuff, of references that I didn't really understand. And... I think it really needs to be updated. Nobody was riding it. Um, some of the animatronics were very elaborate. And uh, I was clearly inspired by the Haunted Mansion. I just like the Haunted Mansion. I mean, the Haunted Mansion is just so beloved, but it's some parts of it are old, but it's like just has this quirky, charming, fun, scary, but not actually scary. Um, just... Uh, cute and fun scary and I love that about the Haunted Mansion and this is more just like weird <laughs> like what am I looking at it has the same track ride system like like the doom buggies they call them at the, at, at the Haunted Mansion so these continuously moving um, yeah like two or three person little wagons that point you exactly always where you're supposed to look and they just rotate you through the attraction and it uses some effects that are the same type of effects used in the Haunted Mansion. So a really uh, old uh, illusion called uh, Pepper's Ghost and I don't want to explain that here but it's really neat to look at how that illusion works because um, it's a very old illusion and uh, but it's still just really tricks you to this day. I love these things that are maybe 100 or 200 years old and are still trip up your brain to this day. And uh, and then there was a part where, uh, you know, it faces you towards mirrors and then through a similar mechanic and reflections and glass and stuff like that, it makes it look like there's a ghost sitting in your car with you. So they do something exactly the same in Haunted Mansion. But anyways, nobody else was on this ride, which made it feel even more weird to be on. We went on Mouse au Chocolat, which is also very Disney similar. It's like a dark ride. Uh, the theming in that one is gorgeous, uh, like this bakery theme with mice. So it's obviously very reminiscent of uh, Ratatouille as well. But, uh, but it's not Disney, so it's it's just its own thing. The ride is fun, but I just don't like this trend of these shooting dark rides where, um, yeah, it's just like a shooting game and you're on moving cars, but each one just moves you through a thing. Like the structure looks like a bakery. I think they pipe in the smell of like chocolate and vanilla and stuff. Like I could smell sweetness. I actually found it, I'm really bothered by like overly sweet smells. So this was kind of cloyingly sweet. It was kind of bothering me, but the theming of the areas you're moving through to look like a bakery or a cake factory look really cool. But the actual shooting elements, I don't know. I just find that kind of boring and I'd rather have animatronics. And of course that's more expensive, but yeah, I'd rather have just the theming and the animatronics. And even if, uh, you know, even if it's old. So talk a little bit about accessibility in the park. Um, they do actually have a discounted and free rate, depending on how, I don't know how it works in Germany exactly, but it's based on like, there's like a percentage disabled essentially. So it could be like 50% or a hundred percent. And then uh, that dictates how much, uh, um, I don't know. It seems different for different businesses, but at Fantasyland, they do. It's nice that they do at least have discounted or uh, free admission, depending on your status. But unfortunately, that's uh, only if you have that, uh, like the disability ID or whatever papers. Germany is very much bureaucracy and paperwork, so you always need that. 
Um, when you go there, they did have a disability brochure. So the brochure has uh, different conditions on each page. Like it has one for heart issues, back and spine, for general mobility, uh, for hearing, uh, for cognitive and all this kind of stuff. And then actually lists each ride in relation to those conditions. And it says green, yellow, or red. And red is you're not allowed to ride. Yellow is basically sign a waiver. Or often it's just have an accompanying like helper person with you. And green is no restrictions. And uh, yeah, it seems like they're mostly just for a lot of it, making sure that you can follow the safety instructions, right? And uh, yeah, so that's the important thing, like be able to fo follow the instructions of the ride operator. It is helpful with the brochure that it lists specifically like phobias as well. So it has a page for fear of heights, for claustrophobia, like tight spaces and fear of the dark. So, so even if that affects you a bit, you can just use it as a, uh, you know, just a guide of like which are going to be the darkest, scariest rides or which are going to be the most claustrophobic rides, um, that kind of thing. So that really helps a lot with autism too. Like just as much information I can have, that helps me to be less anxious, you know, like to watch POVs of rides. Um, I think that's a good tip. Like if you're scared about rides, you, uh, you, you can watch point of view videos on YouTube and just see the entire ride experience. And um, yeah, I wish there was more the experience of the actual lineup and what to do, like loading onto the train, because that gives me a lot of anxiety. But um, but it's nice that they give you this extra information uh, if you have these, if these, these phobias. There's things I wish the park had to make things more neurodivergence friendly, especially in terms of sensory and in terms of waiting time, you know, crowd anxiety, that kind of thing. Um, they don't have any kind of like sensory room to hide out in, like sensory calming space, or just even just a quiet room with where you could have dim lights and sit comfortably and be quiet. I've seen other theme parks and just institutions adding this kind of thing. And I think that should be everywhere where there's crowds and noise and stuff like that. Um, luckily, we were staying in a hotel on site and that's part of the reason we did this because yeah, like I need a break. Um, I was getting really overwhelmed at certain points. So it was amazing to be able to go back to the hotel. But if there was a room in the park, that'd be nice for the people uh, who would otherwise have to leave the park and go to their car, you know, um, which is logistically complicated. Or even for people who are staying at the hotel, just have a quick go in there for five or 10 minutes and, and uh, sensory decompress a little bit. Like I was saying before, I wish they had a way to skip the line. So Disneyland has a really fair system, I feel like. So it doesn't let you just go so you need this disability access card, I think it's called. And it doesn't let you just like have a skip the line pass and jump ahead of everybody. What they do is you go to the ride and they go to the estimated wait time. Like, okay, this ride has a 30 minute wait time right now, or right now it has a 45 minute rate wait time. And then they give you a pass that says, come back in 45 minutes. So you can go sit in the shade or sit in the quiet or some more sensory calming area, not have to stand in line and be a bunch around a bunch of loud people and by the loud track roaring by and all that stuff. And, or you can sit and have some food or have some water. And to me, that's huge because the hardest thing for me is staying in line. It causes me physical pain because of my scoliosis and stuff too, just, just standing if I can't, when I'm walking, I'm usually okay, but standing in one place, I get very uncomfortable. Um, like really hurts my back. And then just a lot of anxiety and overwhelm just from the people and the noises and everything. And 
Yeah, I wish on the they had a map. I've seen places have a specific sensory map. So it'll go here and it'll be like, oh yeah, on uh, it could say on Mouse au Chocolat, it, we pump in baking smells and it might be like overwhelming if you're sensitive to scents. And um, yeah, this ride is like, has a lot of spinning, so it'll make you dizzy. Um, this part of the park is playing music really loud all the time. Um, this part has like, is next to where the magnetic launching is of the roller coaster. So that might be really loud, like a sensory map. That'd be really cool. That'd be really helpful. And something that had de detailed description of, uh, like I was saying before, like loading onto a ride, the rules. So I could just read that ahead of time. Like essentially, if you know social stories, it's like a visual thing of like, this is what you do. It's like, you're gonna line up, then you're gonna get a wristband, and then you're gonna have to put use the wristband to put stuff in the locker, and then you're gonna go through metal detectors, and then you're gonna sit in the chair on the ride, and then you're gonna pull the restraints down, you know? Like, as you're going onto the ride, there's little, like, a video or a sign that says what to do, but if you're like me and you have a lot of, um, yeah, just anxiety, but also working memory issues, like keeping that information in my head is hard, especially when I am anxious. So being able to look at those step-by-step -step things ahead of time is super helpful. And another specific thing, and this is like uh, European parks, German parks. I don't know if I used to smoke. I, you know, I still smoke sometimes, but uh, so I don't really mind people smoking, but I would just for everybody's sake kind of wish they would ban smoking the, or like at least just have smoking areas. Like I'm fine with designated smoking areas that are outdoors, but here you can smoke. You can't smoke in line for a ride, like, cause those get kind of a lot of the times indoors or in enclosed outdoor areas. So you can't smoke in line, but you can smoke everywhere else and right up to the edge of the line if it's going to like the, the uh, where everybody's walking, right? So, so if you have an issue with smoke, like that's gonna be an issue because you're definitely gonna get smoke blowing in your face sometimes. So uh, just if they'd change that to, you know, it's Germany, it's still big smoking culture, but eventually hopefully they change it to at least just like designated smoking areas. So I'm gonna talk about the hotels a bit. They're so cool. So there's three themed hotels that are integrated right into the park and are connected to the park in terms of like, um, so there's Hotel Charles Lindbergh, uh, Lingbao and Matamba. And Charles Lindbergh is previously talked about the Rootberg area, so it's steampunk. So the whole thing, I'll link a video about this because uh, somebody explains, it's so worth watching if you're interested in this at all, because <laughs> you can stay basically within these hotel room, they're like pods, they're little portals, two person. Uh, it's like you're sleeping inside a barrel or something, the way it's themed. Uh, super immersive, it's super weird. You're staying overnight, like inside where the roller coaster is. So inside the park. And that's something you can't do almost anywhere else in the world. Um, like I was saying, my hotel that we stayed at Matamba had a roller coaster going through part of it, but that is like the roller coaster and the hotel are all one entity and woven together. Um, so you can see parts of the track just right outside your little portal hotel room door. And that's a whole experience because uh, if you stay there, you get early access to fly, I believe, and a fast pass and hotel entrance have their own special entrance to fly uh, that has its, uh, that skips a lot of the rest of the line. So yeah, I really want to stay there next because that's probably the, the coolest hotel to stay as a roller coaster enthusiast that I've ever seen. Um, Lingbao is the China themed hotel. I think it is very heavily themed and beautiful. It has uh, like gardens with water features 
and a beautiful, like just colorful bar area. And, but I think it's the most traditional hotel. It's the one that's most like, it's sort of integrated into park, but it doesn't have a ride. So I guess it would be a little bit quieter there, like for people who don't want a, a roller coaster ripping through <laughs> their hotel. Um, and I think it's the old, oldest one too. So that one's the most like, it's very themed, but still feels the most like a traditional hotel. And then, uh, and then Matamba, where we stayed in, in between, very, very much themed. So this Africa themed. It's really bizarre to stay in something that's like, it's like a giant hotel, but it's like this, like, looks like an adobe construction building, but it's a huge hotel and it has a roller coaster going through it. And, uh, and you're in Germany. They did put a lot of effort into theming. It's gorgeous. There's like sounds of animals playing, like as if you're on safari or something. And, and we checked in. This is just such a good experience. Like I knew the, I'd seen from videos, the roller coaster uh, going through a section of the hotel and all that stuff, but I wasn't ready for like, we checked in and I looked to the check-in desk and I looked left and there's the bar lounge area and there's a door open to a patio and right next to the patio is the track of the roller coaster and the roller coaster just rips by and I was just like, oh my God, it's right there. It's right there. So you can just chill out there and watch it go by. I love that so much. And so a bit about our, our room, uh, the theming was really cool. Um, just staying there in the winter, it was weirdly cold. So this kind of like, I just didn't like, the floor was just hard and kind of stone. Like I think in the summer it'd be fine. You'd be wearing shoes and whatever, and it'd be warm. But this disconnect of staying in something Africa themed, but being cold, like a hotel doesn't have to be cold, but I don't know, our room was strangely cold. They did give us a space heater, which was nice, but um, yeah, our room was just cold. But the theming was really cool. You know, these kind of like canopy beds, bug nets, like safari camping vibes. Um, maybe a bit like colonial, I guess, in a slightly uncomfortable way, but um, yeah. I had, uh, um, and then the area where I was sleeping in, uh, my mom stayed in the like master bed area and I was really happy to stay in. It's probably meant to be like the kids area. There's a second little bed. There's no windows, but the door is just open to the hallway, but it made it this really cozy like canopy bed. And it was just like camping out in a little fort. And so that made me really safe and cozy. So I liked my little fort camp bed. Yeah, so I really liked the hotel. We had our own separate entrance into the park. So that was amazing for coming and going. Uh, Black Mambo to get on the ride was just a few steps out of our hotel, essentially. And um, yeah, so no lines like getting into the, into the hotel at all. It made it super chill. Helps reduce the stress as well. Like for me and, or anybody, it was a lot of anxiety about lines and crowds and stuff. And uh, yeah, so I think it's worth staying at the hotel. And and you do get uh, two, I think it was two skip the line passes per person staying, but they're limited to like six different attractions, I think, six or eight. But they were all ones that were, because this was kind of, it was fall. So it was still pretty busy there that weekend, but all the rides that were on the skip the line were like a little bit older ones. It was some of the roller coasters, but it was older ones and all the newest, like hottest rides, you know, Fly and Terran and stuff like that did not have the pass. So I still had to wait in the longest lines, unfortunately. And I didn't end up actually using any of those passes because the stuff I did ride had like a five, 10 minute wait anyways. Uh, so there wasn't really any point. We just gave them away to a family, which was nice. But um, yeah, they probably come in more handy if it's a super busy weekend. But I wish like you're paying to stay in a very expensive hotel. So like just give me one pass for like one of the uh, 
hottest rides or something. Like they do do that in the Charles Lindbergh for Fly, but I think each hotel, you know, if they want to theme them and connect them, like just give them each one ride that they get a special pass to, I think that'd be a little bit more, a little bit more satisfying that way. But uh, yeah, the hotels are really great. Uh, it just makes it more so much more fun to stay in the park and uh, so much more easy with uh, eating dinner and everything as well. So, and then, yeah, the food, uh, the hotel food at Matamba, they had a really great buffet. I usually don't like buffets, but this was really fun. It's not actually like African food, but uh, it's very inventive and just very well made and flavorful food. So, and they had fun little things, like they had a grill and they had like, uh, I didn't try this. I don't know, I can't eat a, like it was like zebra meat. <laughs> I was like, I can't eat a zebra. Um, and they had like alligator and stuff like that. So you could try some more exotic things. And yeah, I think they were just using a bit more like maybe like African ingredients and spices and stuff like that. Certainly like exotic as far as being in Germany goes, but yeah, just super tasty food. And then in the park, the park food was shockingly good and inexpensive for a theme park. Like a theme park is like, they have you there. It's hard to leave. There's nothing else around there. So they don't have a lot of incentive. Like a lot of theme parks have been going to. It's like, maybe there's some good food. A lot of it's mediocre at other theme parks and usually like very, very expensive. And this is just like absolutely fantastic food. The snacks, the meals, and just, you know, like 13, 15 euros, like for an entree at a sit down restaurant, you know, um, and uh, like fantastic food and um, getting different snacks and stuff. And these beautiful waffles, with very generous with toppings. I think maybe those were like seven or eight bucks or something like that. And he converted it, uh, well, maybe like 10. But um, yeah, and they had like more healthy things than I think you'd normally find in a theme park. Delicious candies, and then a good variety of like, they had sort of like a Mexican slash like Spanish uh, tapas. Um, and, and then, yeah, the one I talked about, we went to this heavily themed place where it's like you're in this old Nordic cabin kind of thing. I guess it's more the area is a bit like Viking themed. So it has that kind of vibe and just eating out of these like metal pots and on real slates off of these heavy wood tables and benches. And it was beautiful in there. And I had like uh, goulash soup, which was so, so good and delicious bread and everything. So yeah, surprisingly good food. So yeah, Fantasyland is fantastic. I highly recommend everybody visit. I want to go back. It's an absolute dream park. It's uh, definitely one of the best I've been to. Um, has to be one of the top parks in Europe and uh, one of the top ones in the world as well, I think. Just a really good balance of like theming and th fairly thrilling rides, but they're not super intense, super tall. You know, there's no um, no giga giga coasters or anything like that there, but it has this like Disneyland uh, like sort of theming level, but without the IP, so you don't feel quite as connected to it. But a lot of the theming is just really beautiful, really well done, and and all the rides feel like you're like, oh, this like looks like a Disney ride, but they always end up being like more surprises and longer and more thrilling than you expect. Um, I thought the merchandise was really subpar. Some people might not care about that at all. But I think it's so fun just to get like my favorite ride and just like a really cool shirt or something to commemorate it or like a stuffy or like keychain or whatever. And I don't know, the graphic design on them, I just thought was terrible. Like even with the 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 high of being there i didn't want to spend you know i didn't end up buying any of that stuff which says a lot um yeah after like the the way they operate the rides is fantastic they're just getting people on there the people that work there seems to seem to be having 
a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, the music that's just playing theme to the different rides. Um, I don't say this often other than like a Disney park, but I was actually looking up and listening to the ride themes afterwards. So I think that says a lot. And uh, yeah, just Fly and Terran, like some of the best combination of theming and ride quality anywhere. Um, and Fly is just like beautiful, perfect. I can't wait to go back. I want to go back. I already, I just dream about that ride. It is like it came out of my dreams, my lifetime dr dreams of, of flying or falling off things or tumbling through the air. And um, yeah, it just gave me that surreal and sensation of something, manifesting something from my dreams, but in a good way. So uh, yeah, that was my very in-depth of experience of Fantasyland. So you can tell I had so much, so much fun there. And um, yeah, thank you for listening. This is again, roller coasters are one of my special interests. One of my dreams of many dreams is to be a ride reviewer. And I'd like to do it from a neurodivergent lens, you know, like uh, explain things about visiting theme parks and uh, like I did in this video of what to expect in terms of sensory experience and accessibility for uh, all disabilities and that kind of thing. So hopefully I can do more of that. Thank you for watching. That really helps support the channel and gives me motivation to go and do these sorts of things. Um, if you want to check out the rest of the channel, I have lots of other videos related to neurodiversity topics. And yeah, thank you for watching. Bye.